Right. Um, thank you, Perona. Thank you all for giving up a perfectly good Saturday to all this. Thank you to the college for putting on the show. Thank you to so many people who have been so supportive. And for those of you who are uh, people who've worked in the studio, thank you too. It's what my life is about. Right. What I want to do is to try and get across something of the idea of why the things in the gallery look as they do, because any one of them could have looked any way. The thing about printmaking in layers is you can print any colour in any colour you want, any layer in any colour you want. So there are a limitless number of choices. And the, there is a reason why they look like they look. Um, and one of the things that goes with their look is a sense of self-assurance. Okay, I'm done. I'm cooked. It's finished. Sometimes things aren't, but generally they like that. And part of the role of a studio like mine is to find technical solutions to aesthetic problems, which all sounds very fine and easy. But actually, often the things that are being requested don't have a conventional answer or... Um, the person in question has, or the artist in question, has something about them and their way of being that requires a tougher or a softer or a more engaging approach. And the next thing is getting through monoprinting and f exploring an image, finding a way of uh, developing the right vocabulary. The, these are the things that I want to go through. Um, but what I want you to carry in your head all the way through is that the journey to the finished image is often uh, a product of about four or five sources that somehow coalesce in the minds of those who are making them. Right, here we go. Now, is that going to work? I'm pressing number... Ah, there we are. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at the work of four artists, uh, and there is a logic to it. This is one of the first, if not the first print I made with Stephen Chambers. Um, it's called Journey, uh, sorry, Venture to the Exterior. Um, you should know that his um, print titles come from the Penguin list of published books, uh, sometimes edited. So the Venture to the Interior is a book, but this is Venture to the Exterior. What you see is um, a very interesting mixture of silhouette and drawing. In this case, it's mostly silhouette, but sometimes you see through. And Stephen came to me. Uh, he'd been making etchings with Sheen Colley in the back. If that means anything to anybody, you can put up a hand. If not, it doesn't matter. But Sheen Collie is where you print onto a paper behind the plate. And he was using pattern papers and things, but the thing about the pattern was it ran right the way through the whole image. And he'd begun to get really interested in the idea of relating the pattern to the form uh, of the image and so on. And so these were early... This was an early print. And you can see the... I mean, the print is uh, about this big and um, the chunks of pattern are quite large uh, and it's terrific. I mean, I loved it, and, but it's in the light of what comes later, you'll realise it's... In, and in terms of his expectations, I think it's clunky. But we had to get to learn how to dance together. OK, now this is the second one. This is called the Kelly Gang. Uh, I discovered in the making of this that the Kellys uh, used to live in the middle of nowhere, and because there weren't many women around, the, the guys used to dress up um, in frocks and things, you know, to make life interesting. But anyway, the, um, the, this, again, uh, has the pattern running through. 
Um, there's a, a warning of future things to come with Stephen in that the foreground's got a, a bronze ink. Uh, more recently, he's become the king of uh, gold leaf. Okay, now, after those, there were a string of prints, um, one of which was called A Little Larger Than the, than the Entire Universe. And without permission, I have to say, I printed a proof using white instead of color on black. And there were about seven or eight stencils, and I printed them all in transparent white. Because I, I was interested. And it could have gone in the bin, but I showed it to Stephen, imagining him say, that that's a, a waste of time. And he lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, and I, I mean, it was irresponsible. But there we go. Now what you see, which is beginning of something much more important, um, and I'm maybe going to have to wander away from the microphone so I can, I can do this stuff. But out here, the pattern is positive. That's white or transparent white on black. In here, it's black on white. Okay, and that, and that had become a very important feature of his work, this inversion of the pattern structure. Um, and also, you see uh, inside the silhouette. I've got a pointer. Ooh. Ooh. <coughs> ah. You see inside the silhouette that this drawing, it's quite a nice game going on there. It isn't a silhouette, it's both silhouette and drawing. And, and the, uh, the nature of the um, uh, pattern to that is important. Anyway, this was made, as I said, irresponsibly. And there you can see a detail from inside it. And it's not particularly brilliant. Uh, it was just slung together, and it seemed like a nice idea. And also, it was printed on arche, which is, is uh, arche noir, arche black, is very tough. Um, and the later things we did on black were done on the Somerset, uh, which is it's like velvet. It's beautiful. OK. So as a result of that, uh, two large prints were made called um, Journeys Without Maps, East and West. And this is where, having really, really beaten the shit out of the whole idea, we've got control over the transparency and opacity of the white. So in the background, it's uh, about a 25% opaque white, so it's very soft. And then there's an uh, ivory that's printed in the middle, and that had to be done three times exactly. And then the black, which is the detail inside the image, is printed um, twice. So we're printing dot for dot right the way through. But the, I'll stress the evolution of this image starts right back in the first slide I showed you with the clunky pattern, which gradually refines down and we all learn as we go along. So this is one of a pair, and here's the other one. And the business of printing something like this is uh, slightly nightmarish, but somebody wrote a review um, of the show recently, and an American editor talking about it said, OK, so it was really difficult to do and it took 90 colours to print it, but what effect did that have on the image? And it's, it's a really good observation. It doesn't matter whether it's difficult or whether it's hard or whether it involves a lot of complexity. It's whether the damn thing works. And if it doesn't work, there's, there's no point in, in doing it. OK. So at the same time that that was happening, prints of this sort were being made. And these are infinitely more complex. 
behind, in the background, there are layers of wash, um, two or three colors, and then there's the pattern going in three or four times to build up the gold and other stuff. And then there's the main image going in, in dark. And then there's the pattern reversed out, fitting in. The whole thing is a sort of uh, a technical tour de force. But it, going back again to the beginning, it has to look self-confident. It has to look like it belongs there. It has to look like all the choices were made for the right reasons. And they were. It's called The Moon is Down. It's very beautiful. OK, so this is us. Um, I think on the news they would say discussing or robust discussion <laughs> about, about, about the strength of the whites. Um, it's not a stand-up row, but it's certainly a, a good discussion. Um, and it's how far we can push things before they break. It has to go right up to the edge. And then, as a result of that, uh, this emerged. It's called Self-Portrait as an Exploding Shed. Um, and unfortunately, we were working with projected images and so on. This has, from east to, the, sorry, going from the first irresponsible black and white one through east and west to this, everything has gone up a stage of refinement getting more and more controlled. And now that with this, that we have tremendous control, this thread of the work is finished. So all the learning has gone into it. Right. Now, part of the evolution of this, as Peter was saying earlier on about making artwork, is that everything's made in black and white. Uh, so even with the coloured images, everything's made in black and white. And the, um, uh, everything is made the other way round. Uh, so, hang on a second. We made a piece of work with Stephen called The Big Country. Some of you will know about it, some of you won't. It's 78 sheets this big, which all fit together. There's a picture of it in the catalogue, and I'll show it to you in a moment. Um, but you get some idea of scale uh, when you see the other photograph. This is him lying on a bench with a bit of one of the things. And you can see the sheets joining up. Um, if I can get the right button. So sheets joining up. Yep, there, there, and so on. Um, and... Uh, Again, a feat of technical control in that the pattern that is running through the background had to be accurate over 15 metres. So one dot has to join up with the next dot, has to join up with the next dot. Um, and you may ask yourself, why did it have to be that precise? Who's going to notice? Does it affect the aesthetics? And you'd be probably right. OK, that's another section of the same thing, made in bits. Um, the, the learning that was required to make this happen was immense. My son, Tim, who is a, a complete computer whiz, um, discovered a way of uh, inverting an image uh, and making a, a crop mask at the same time and various other things. It's something that I could do an analog. Uh, I can do it with regular printing equipment and in the print down frame. But what we wanted to be able to do was to alter the size of the apertures between the dots and various things like that. So without uh, his involvement, this could not have happened. Um, that is one third of a ton of printed paper. And you can see the pattern there. I'm saying it's accurate, running right the way down the edge. Um, all cropped by hand, because we hadn't got any alternative. And like a lot of big projects, I leave them slightly stunned 
and then only later realize what we've done. Um, I don't know if I'm being coherent enough, really. W what I want to say is the stumbling start, stumbling moves made at the start of working with Stephen ran through a whole series of very complex ideas, including this one, and then on to a load of complex color prints. Each one is conditioned by the one before. Each bit of learning is passed on. And for, for me as an individual, each encounter with an artist gives me a new entry in my recipe book. So that's it. It's, it's 15 meters from there to there. Um, big. And the other thing is that it can be configured in almost any way you choose. Uh, right. Now, this is um, working with Willard. Uh, Willard Buckley um, lives in New York and has a studio also in Vermont. He's a sculptor. Um, uh, I can't remember how many years ago, but he was hit with a, a ghastly disease. So he has to work through others' hands. Um, and in terms of collaboration, that's a tremendous thing uh, in that, um, and it must be as frustrating as hell for him, but it's tremendous for us. And he has the um, amazing openness and warmth uh, uh, in his way of engaging. And also, he's a damn good sculptor a really good one. And uh, we make mostly monoprints together, but from the monoprints, we choose some to make additions. So what I'm now going to show you in a sense is the reverse of Stephen's story. I'll show you a couple of additions, and then some of the monoprints that are behind those ideas, the kind of thinking that goes behind it. Um, what you can see on the screen here, it's just regular screen press with me printing, we can see three images up on the screen. What we try and do with Willard, if we can work on a big, really big screen, uh, is to have four or five <clears throat> quite large elements all set up, all registered, so we can bounce from one to the other without having to stop or check, so everything gets, gets set up before we start. Um, if something strikes you in this, please do yell, all right? Okay, so this is an edition. Um, all his prints have dates for titles. Um, oh, come back. Bloody hell. <laughs> um, sorry, I've been waiting for that. Uh, you can see that they are to do with uh, an illusion of space um, and folding and bending and transparency and also the, the fourth dimension, that is that things will bend in ways that they can't in reality. So you track, you track the fold of a shape and then it actually bends back the other way and so on. Um, they're, they're nothing to do with geometry, they're to do with um, the imagination of space, and if they could be, they'd be made out of uh, steel or wood. Some of them do get made out of steel or wood, but there are others that can't be. But you can you can see the beautiful overlaying of the colour, and these are made. Uh, that one I think was in about twelve or fourteen layers, so to get the saturation of the blue, but to retain the transparency. The colour is very relatively low saturation, but it's built up four or five times, so that you really see through it. And we use solvent-based pigments, which uh, print like stained glass. Okay, this is another one. And I really, really like the black. What you can't get from this, well, you can get a glimpse, 
is that there's a varnish on that shape there, right? Um, and so under certain conditions, it just punches out and hits you and then vanishes. And so you can get a type of drawing happening uh, that disappears or reveals itself, but it also increases the saturation. Um, the, perhaps it's just me, but the, it feels like there's a, a real poetry in these things and that they suggest much more than the raw elements actually contain. Okay, so these are monoprints. And you would say, what's the difference? Well, in a sense, there isn't a difference in that uh, all the same kind of stuff goes into it. But there is only one of them. Um, and the way we tend to work is to have a stack of, they're usually multiples of three. Um, so 12 or 15 or whatever sheets. And they get divided into groups. And if we've got, say, four base elements, there would be 12 sheets. And the first three sheets get color one that we've selected. The next three get, that's through uh, element one, stencil one or whatever. And then it gets stent color two, color three, color four, uh, uh, through, the, through the groups. Then they're shuffled like a pack of cards and go back to the beginning. And then they get shuffled like a pack of cards until each one of them is unique. And at that point, it stops being random and it becomes proper intuition. This one needs this, or it needs that, or it needs the other. And the colors go back and back and over and over. And suddenly they open up. They start to talk to you. And uh, what I said earlier on about what is it that makes this thing the one that should go on the wall? It's the one that tells you, this works, I'm here, I've arrived, as Alex said, I'm here. You know, but the thing is announcing its own arrival. Look at, look at that, I'll go back again. It's, it's fun, isn't it? Now you imagine having 30 of those to play with. Okay, and out of this image series came these. Now, these were additioned. On, when working on black, we usually put a, semi, a transparent white underneath. And that is the image formed in transparent white with one layer... Um, yeah, hang on a minute, where's my pointer gone? One layer up there. And, and one layer there, but they make two layers there, and then two layers here, which goes into that shape, which gives you the extra build-up so that they all differentiate from one another. All right, so this is, having made all the monoprints and decided we want to do something, we thought we would do this. That one, then that one, which is, uh, this is interesting because here there is a, a yellow, with no white underneath it. Yep. And here there is a soft blue with only one white, and that's got two whites up there. You getting the, the plan? It's, it's pretty nifty, I think. And at the moment, this one is in our sitting room at home. And the, this yellow over black that goes green up here is fantastic. And the vocabulary of colour, I mean, when uh, Nigel was asked earlier, so how do you choose your colours or whatever, they, they come and find you, really and you have your alphabet somewhere back here uh, that you draw on, and that's going to work, that's going to work. That's an interesting thing. But when you add to that the veiling of layers and transparency and semi-opacity and so on, you get a, a very rich and diverse language. 
Now, in the show, there is a purple print, which is a double zigzag. And this is made out of just two shapes. I chose this side because... Um, slide. Image. Where's my thing? Tracking from there. That is one shape. Yep. Yeah. And that... is another one. The whole thing is made out of two zigzag shapes, which then get split at various points uh, and layered up in different ways. Now, this one I put in early because it's using semi-opaque colours, which are not as kind of generous in their spirit as the transparent ones are. Um, but you begin to see the emergence of things like uh, this and so on, which start to make the surface fold and, and things. Okay, that's an extension of that idea, still using the same kind of palette. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> and then out of it came this which is pretty much, this is a monoprint, but what's in the gallery is the edition version, which has got more power still. So we've, we've looked at the work of two artists, different routes through, different outcomes, but it, it is definitely, oh God, it's so hackneyed, it's a journey. It, it is definitely a journey from A to B, or via Abergavenny, OK, now these are from a couple of weeks ago, a bit more than. And I won't take too long on them. But look, there's three in a row there, three different monoprints. Can you see that one at all? That really is lovely. It's in deep red on black. OK, and this was the beginning of some very new ones. Right. Next. And it's five artists I'm going to talk about, not four. Um, so I'd better get my skates on. This is Carol Robertson. Uh, Carol uh, has a piece in the show, and uh, her... Um, sorry, I've just got to remember some titles that are here. Um, her work is very structured, but simply through colour, incredibly evocative and compelling. I mean, she really has got a good eye. Um, this shows a press for setup, not for uh, the prints I'm going to show you, but for a later one. But it's a very good indication. Down here, these are the register marks. So sheet one would register for that and that, right? Left hand side. For all, for those who don't make prints, all print make all printing uses one corner and one side of the thing the sheet to register. You have to use the same corner and the same side all the time, otherwise it goes to hell. There are other ways of registering, but essentially that's it. One corner, one side. And so here we've got a setup for five colours. You can see the stencils up here on the screen ready to print. So there's vertical bars and then bits that all fit together. And these, it, it took about three or four days to get this set up. You start with colour one and then you uh, work using transparent overlay to get the register for two right. And pretty, pretty, you think it's right and then you put in the next one and you realise it should have moved by a nanometer up or down and so on. So it's forwards and backwards and so on. But once set up, that's how we can hurtle through the colours on Willard's 
it's how we can hurtle through the colours here on, on carols. Um, and it just removes a whole problem, which is how the hell do we fit everything together? You just make sure it all fits together before you start, and then you can bounce across. And, you know, in making uh, Carol's work, we probably mix 30, 40 colours uh, to her instructions. And they're all grouped so that they speak to each other. OK, this is just a paper stencil. But what I'm going to show you is some, are some prints that are set up to the one, two, three, four, five, um, but with uh, paper masks going in so that what seemed like a whole shape becomes uh, something simpler. So, you ready? I'll just go through these and I'm happy to go backwards to... Okay, I'll go, I'll go back up again because there's things I want to show you. Can you see little moments like that? They're little flashes of red that only appear as tiny intersections between the images, between the layers, sorry. Um, but they're... You see what I mean about uh, the sort of evocative nature of the, the work? It, it isn't just a series of concentric circles. They have an emotional load as well in their transparency and opacity. OK. Now, that lot were called uh, Starfield. The, these are from a group called Quantum Connections. Uh, and here... The background, um, there, there, and here, is monoprinted. Uh, so each sheet is printed differently. We just start with a flat rectangle, and Carol paints into it, and then we print, print it. Um, all the other stuff is coming from a string of stencils. Um, and you can see the same uh, crossover things happening, all of which have to be spot on, point to point. So here you've got a mixture of monoprinting and the control of the other thing. I mean... Damn it, look at that. <laughs> okay, now into something completely different. Out of hard, rigid edged stuff. This is the world of Clarewin James. Uh, Clarewin uh, is a uh, a figurative artist and she draws and paints very well and has a, a, an odd characteristic in her work in that it feels like it's drawing on a deep memory but I can't what, who am I to say anyway what you see here is Claire when painting direct onto the screen you see the, the pattern that is down here that's actually underneath there. So although they're not in contact with each other, she's using the pattern as a, as a guide. Um, but she's painting with transparent, in this instance, transparent blue, I think, onto the mesh. Um, and one of the really confusing things you need to know is that when you're monoprinting on the screen press, whatever you put down first, whatever you paint first, comes out on top. 
it really is slightly mind-blowing. So if you paint a yellow dot and you, f and you print black through the rest of it, the yellow dot will predominate. Um, so using that characteristic, you can make one type of image and then overlay another one. So, for instance, a pattern and then a background. And know that having drawn the pattern tightly in the first instance, it will stay tight. And we used heavy retarders in the ink so that they take a long time to dry on the screen. So you get 20, 30 minutes to work at it. OK, so Clarewin made some charcoal drawings on true grain film. Um, I made stencils from them and printed them. So this is this, it's a, an oblique angle. But this is one of the, um, the prints of the charcoal drawings. Um, it shows you where screen printing has got to, because it would be a pretty good lith lithograph, really. OK, so this is Clarewin painting on the screen. And what you see here is the flesh colour, there's a transparent yellow and a red and a blue and all that. And it looks such an awful mess. But when they're printed, they come out like this. And that's printed over the charcoal drawing. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I would say you do need to know your ink chemistry and <laughs> the rest of it to be able to pull this trick off, but it's, it's pretty good. Gives you some idea of the scale. OK, now this is where I'm sort of heading towards the, the sort of the core of what I want to say and the end of what I want to say. Uh, my life has been a very fortunate one. Um, I've been doing what I wanted to do all my life and working with very, very interesting, very nice people who've let me play with their ideas. Somehow... Um, We've been able to afford things somehow. We've been able to reinvest the earning in new publications. Somehow the adventure has worked and continues to do so. Um, this is John McLean, uh, who I'm very close to and who is currently ill as hell. But um, he's a very good artist and he's still working in the studio a couple of half days a week or days a week and making beautiful paintings. Anyway, um, all the monoprinting stuff <clears throat> that you saw with Clarewin is used by John. All the transparency and overlays and stuff that you saw with Willard is used by John. I, I, it's just how it's worked out that he is a very adventurous printmaker. I mean, and you know, he is. Um, right, we're going to get some wood and we're going to cut it up and we're going to make prints from it, he will say. So we do. Um, and I, he tends to be quite ahead of me in terms of his thinking. Anyway, so this is him painting straight on the screen. And for a, a, an enormous project we did, that was the base material. That's two stencils. A flat with a hole in it and a hole to go into the <laughs> flat. That's it. And painting direct on the, the screen in this kind of way. This, these are some smaller ones. But painting direct on the mesh. You end up with things like that. That's about 70 or 80 centimetres across on the, on the black. Um, and they've got this odd mixture of a flat surface, um, a very handmade mark, 
um, a unity of surface in that it all feels printed, um, but fully auto it's a real autograph mark, you know? So that's, that's a proper monotype, actually, monotype. Okay, now with the more complicated ones, um, we make lots of masks uh, so that in painting onto the screen, areas could be masked down um, and you get sequential layering of the painting on the screen. Um, doing this kind of thing, we could make maybe 10 or 15 monoprints a day. Um, quite, you know, a, quite a size. So what John's doing here is, he, having made a, a drawing, he's, he's cutting a, a set of paper masks. And these are other ones from another image uh, after they've been used. And that's the kind of print that comes out of those paper masks. And the thing is that, uh, like with the learning with Stephen's black and white, like with the learning with Willard's monos, like with the, um, all, all, all the other experiments, these things take us into areas where we know that could be a good addition. Or, to hell with the idea of an addition, it just works as it is. Well, I, I really, really like this kind of stuff. And maybe it's just me, but I think he's terrific. OK, this one's somewhat different. This was printed from a blank etching plate uh, with using just um, using etching ink let down with oil. And... You know, this is the power of uh, the end of a piece of cloth, wiping, <laughs> wiping something away. Now, that's what they look like before they're printed. So you, you have to have in the back of your head um, an image of where you want to travel to. But once you've seen it happen once, then the language is very evident. And... I mean, sitting at the back of the room here is Peter Griffin, with whom I've made loads of monoprints. And, you know, I think it's fair to say it makes you hop up and down when they work. Yeah? Yeah, it does. <laughs> OK, so when John kind of would... Yeah? Oh no! It's just, uh, all, all, all you do is uh, wet the surface with, uh, so the squeegee doesn't bite. So you wet it with a bit of extender or whatever, and then you just go straight across. Yeah. And then you have to clean it all up. Because, like I said, when the first one goes down, first mark goes down, it seals the mesh. Yeah. OK, so in a normal working day, John, come into the studio and there'd be a string of uh, pile of paper, crayons. Uh, he'd have been sitting on the train down from London or bringing with him some drawings and saying, you know, I think I found a fish in which, a barrel in which there are a load of fish, you know, we'll shoot them. And uh, then he'd sit down and he'd draw. Uh, and draw and draw and draw and draw. And then we'd probably go onto a blank screen and make monos. Um, but it then develops into things where we start to assemble a real concrete thought. Having made lots of monos and done a number of little pieces, this thing began to emerge. Uh, it's a print called Drum Sturdy. Um, and it's to do with the containment, contained explosion on one side, you know, this thing here, and then the, uh, the bite back in of the white and the opposite on the other side. Um, it's a very sophisticated thing. And you can see, oops, 
you can see here uh, drawings and, and thoughts about how it might be. So having come up with a kind of base, basic drawing, <clears throat> this is him painting the first layer, the black for the, um, for the image. And that's it when it's finished. And here you see the witness under the black. Can you see where I'm pointing? Is it visible from where you are? Okay, so the, the black is really black, but it changes from slightly shiny to slightly matte across the surface. And all these things drop in, and the colours are very sparkly. I think, you know, this is a strong piece. Now, in the show through there, there's also um, uh, uh, a monoprint of John's. And these are from the same group. So if, you, if, you're, if you're back in the show and you're seeing John's monoprint, just carry these in your head and, and realise that it was, a, it was a moment. It was, it was a, a day or two or whenever when this was what was happening. Okay. Now then, with uh, John's poorliness, uh, getting around is difficult. But he's been working a lot in his uh, flat in the Barbican uh, between going to the studio down in Deptford. And I had always wanted to make um, a, a serial work with him. Earlier on today, we were looking at um, poems and or poetry and image. And actually, what I really wanted was to do a folio with John with a really good poet and for him to just let loose. And the, the problem we had was that he couldn't find anybody who was visceral, obscene, uh, harsh enough to go with his you know, world view. I mean, if you, if you know John well, you'll know that um, his vocabulary is fully anglicised. Um, and what he wanted was a poet who had the same kind of grunt. And we couldn't find one. Um, and so in the end, uh, we decided that we'd take a different source. And we chose a piece of music, or he chose a piece of music which is Debussy, um, uh, it's, it's merry-go-round. And um, cheveux en bois, am I right? Yeah. Near enough. <laughs> Adjacent. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, and the, uh, the idea was the near jazz reference, the uh, structural bounce, that you see in Debussy, the angularity, and also the poetry, the fluid poetry. Um, so, because John couldn't get around a lot, I had to come up with a way that he could work easily. And we chose to work with um, uh, etching and a la poupée etching. A la poupée is where it means by dolly. Um, it's where a plate is inked in more than one colour at a time. So in the case of these ones, we could put six or seven or eight colours onto a plate and then have a separate black plate or whatever. Um, and in order for him to be able to position the colours, uh, I printed samples of etching ink, dozens of sheets of flat colour so it could be cut up and collaged onto the artwork. So where he made a drawing in black, it would be printed in black, and where he collaged colour on, it would be colour. So he was actually looking at the result before we'd even proofed it. 
and you can see the um, sorry here these are just samples of color um, and uh, I don't see any here but there are sheets of color around and this is him chopping up black so that he can use it or tearing it and this all sounds very crude but out of it came I don't know I don't use the word I do know I don't use the word very often but out of it came a real masterpiece I mean seriously here is one ninth of that masterpiece look at the subtlety of the wash this is an etching isn't that beautiful and and up the top here it's it's just like a breath of fog or something and the internal tensions inside the image you know the push and the pull and the drag and the and the weight and so on is for me very exciting Anyway, there are nine of these things, and when they're together, they look like that. And if I hadn't made anything else, I'd settle for that. Okay, thank you very much. Got a question here? Did you have a question? No. Any questions for Kip? Ah. Um, this is a bit simple because I don't understand the process very well for the printing. How do you get that very soft, almost charcoal-like look if it's an engraving? Right. Uh, it's a photopolymer etching which means the, uh, the artwork for it was made on uh, a piece of true grain polyester using gouache, and then it shot onto a, a, a plate. You can do the same by working with bitumen um, and stroking bitumen aquatint. So you can put bitumen aquatint onto a plate and you can stroke it and then bake it in. You get oh. the same thing. But um, the thing about this is because I was working uh, with John in London and me in my studio and so on I had to be sure that if anything happened to the plate uh, I could make another one mm. and, um, and in fact since the advent of photopolymer plates I, I don't use acid anymore I, I can't be oh, okay. uh, I, and the thing is you can do all the other stuff with the photopolymers you can get them so they can go three millimetres deep if you want um, it's a whole new world. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hi, that's not a question. That's uh, to honor you. I mean, so far I was only familiar with uh, the great master printers uh, of old Paris, France, and so on. Mm. I didn't know something like that still exists in this country. And I was thinking about leaving the country after 26 years and think you are and what you are doing is one of the reasons perhaps to stay on. Thank you. Thank you. It, thank you. It's, it's, it's very kind. It's unnecessarily flattering. I mean, we do what we do. I, I'm not saying we in the royal way, we. I mean, we as human beings do what we do. And I think that... Um, were it not for the insanity and drive of the artists, there wouldn't be anything to play with. You mean I'm even worse than Ringo? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I just wanted to say, Kip, that your you're really very humble about your role. These masterpieces wouldn't have been realized had it not been for you. So thank you.
Well, yeah, we know. <laughs> Okay, come on, enough of this. Let's go to the pub. <laughs> Are we no more questions, comments? Well wishes, doubts? <laughs> if you want, what's the time? Uh, the show is still open? The show is still open and it will remain open today for an extra half hour. So, Shall we go and, anybody who wants to, yes. we go and have a look and, yeah? Well, thank you so much, Kip, and thank you to all the speakers. If we could just have a round of applause before we disperse.